Well, hey, good morning, Radiant Church. It is July 5th, and man, happy 4th of July weekend to you. Um, hopefully you have enjoyed uh, celebrating God's freedom with family or friends or whatever you are doing this weekend. We hope it has been a terrific celebration, and man, we are so glad you are worshiping with us uh, this morning. Thank you for tuning in online and being a part of it. We're not meeting in person today, but instead we're all together online. So right now, say hi in the chat. Just tell everyone what you did, maybe uh, for your week weekend plans and say hello, but uh, we're just glad you are here this morning as we dive into God's Word. Well, as we begin, uh, did you know that tickling is actually a form of torture? That's right. Believe it or not, tickling is actually a form of torture. All throughout history, in fact, torture has been done through the use of tickling. In ancient China, for instance, they used to strap people down and tickle them until they were unconscious. Oftentimes it was criminals or prisoners. Even in ancient Rome, they would do this. And believe it or not, in Nazi Germany, they would tickle their criminals. Now, that gives me like a different picture of them, not something you would expect, okay? But tickling has been a form of torture, even to the point of death. Now, I know if you know, if you're a sibling, for instance, if you have older brothers and sisters, you already know that tickling is a form of torture, right? I am the youngest of four siblings, and tickling has been a form of torture all through growing up. My older siblings would pin me down on the ground, and they would use their fingers as weapons into my sensitive spots, and they would, it was bad, okay? They would tickle me until I couldn't breathe. I would beg. I wasn't strong enough. They were bigger than me, including my two sisters at the time, and uh, it was not a pretty sight, okay? Anyone else experience anything like that where you were completely helpless, okay? Now, for them, it was all in good fun, right? Now, I'm not going to name names as to which one uh, tickled me the most, right? But as far as I'm concerned, they're all culpable, right? Because they knew it was happening and did nothing about it, okay? If you have ever experienced something like that, you know what it's like to be completely at the mercy of somebody else. You know what it's like to be powerless, to have no control over a situation, to be completely at the mercy of what other people wanted to do. And by the time they were able to finally give you grace, you know the relief of finally being released from that situation. Maybe you have been at the mercy of people in your life. Maybe growing up, you got in trouble and you were at the mercy of your principal's decision. Perhaps it was an employer or a parent, and you know that feeling when they grant you mercy. Today, we're continuing on in our sermon series called The Beatitudes. We're diving into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 5, if you want to turn there. And we continue to dive in looking at each one of these blessing statements that Jesus is giving to this group of people listening, this group who had been down and out, who had been pushed to the sides of society, and he's inviting them into a new kingdom, the kingdom that he was ushering in. In Matthew 5, verse 3, you begin the Beatitudes, and it says, He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That's where we're going to camp out today in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, Jesus says. Now, the word for mercy is this word elios. It's the word for mercy or pity or even compassion. It's the type of active compassion that looks at someone in need and decides to grant them mercy even if they maybe don't deserve it. Throughout Scripture, Elias is used to to describe the compassion that men have towards other men or women towards other women. It's the type of compassion, the active compassion that God even shows to us. It certainly describes the compassion God had for us when he granted us salvation, but it also points to the mercy that God will have at the end of the age where we will be judged 
And God will see us and show mercy towards us because of Jesus Christ. This word Elias is interwoven throughout Scripture, almost inseparable from the idea that mercy itself is given and granted from an all-loving Creator God. For the believer, this idea of Elias, this, believe, this idea of mercy is, is everything to us, right? We don't have life without mercy. Our life began, we were born again when God granted us mercy when we accepted Christ. And as a believer, we can't have true fellowship with our brothers and sisters without this mercy given by God that we give to one another. You see, mercy is who we are, and mercy is also what we need most. Mercy Point was the starting point for many of us in our salvation when we came to God broken and he granted us grace. Mercy will be our ending point for all time as we are ushered into eternity through God's grace and his compassion on us. Growing up, for whatever reason, in school, I was often taught about gangs and how to avoid gangs, right? And, and our Christian life is, is very much the opposite in many ways of the gang life. You see, when you, when you try to enter into a, a street gang, oftentimes you, you come to them as a whole man or a woman, and oftentimes you are violently beaten to be initiated into the gang. You are broken in order to be accepted into the gang. And oftentimes that, that violent initiation begets more violence as gang activity increases and as you're told and, and as you're a part of violent acts on the street. And in order to get out of the gang, this, the situation is still true. You have to be violently beaten oftentimes in order to be released. In a gang, you come to the gang whole and you are beaten down and become broken. You see, in the Christian life, the exact opposite is true. For us believers, we come to God broken. And it's not through violence, but rather through his mercy that we are then made whole. And because of this mercy from the beginning that God gives us, his mercy then begets more mercy. Around us, we enter into acts of mercy towards our neighbor and towards our enemy. Mercy is also our landing point. It is our final destination. You see, as believers, I believe that we are called to stand in the middle of mercy. What do I mean by that? There's a famous, there's a quote that I, I love so much found here by, by Richard Trench. He's an archbishop and poet in the 1800s. And this quote summarizes the message so perfectly here today. It's a quote I hope sinks into your heart. It says this, the Christian stands in a middle point between a mercy received and a mercy yet needed. As believers, we stand in the middle between a mercy that God has already shown us, a mercy we did not deserve, and the mercy that we need just to make it through another day the mercy we need when we make mistakes, the mercy in the future that we so desperately need from our fellow Christians and from God himself. And as believers, we stand in the middle of a mercy received and a mercy yet given. We see throughout Scripture this idea of giving and receiving mercy to be very real. In Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ forgave you. Also in Romans chapter 2, as it's talking, uh, Paul's talking about judgment, we read, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Throughout Scripture, there's this very real sense that you reap what you sow, that the mercy and compassion and forgiveness that you give is what you will receive. Even Jesus emphasizes this point. 
We see this in, the, in the, some of the characters of the Bible. You think of David in the Old Testament who would eventually become king. He had an enemy by the name of Saul. And at one point, in, Saul is chasing down enemy, trying to, uh, David trying to find his enemy. And David is hiding out in a cave. And as David is in this cave, his enemy Saul approaches, not even knowing that David is there. And what does David do? David pulls out his knife. And he approaches his enemy Saul, and instead of cutting his throat, he cuts the corner of his cloth in an act of mercy. And he shows the piece of cloth to Saul as an olive branch and says, look what could have happened, but instead I'm choosing to show mercy here. And Saul, dumbfounded, has this quote in 1 Samuel. He says, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? This act of mercy, of, of compassion, was unfathomable to him. And yet, we see that the mercy David get, gave in this instance, God gave back to David. See, David would go on to be king, and David would use his power to take on a woman that didn't belong to him and murder her husband. David sinned against the Lord, but because David showed compassion because he gave it freely. God showed him compassion when he had a contrite heart. In the New Testament, you think of Saul of Tarsus. You think of how he was persecuting Christians, actively hunting them down until Jesus blocked his path of evil and he intervened completely, changing Saul's life forever. Jesus took a murderer and he showed compassion to him. And because of that, Paul would then turn around in an instant when Paul was in prison. A violent earthquake would open up the path for Paul to escape prison freely, but instead Paul chooses to stay put. Why? So he can show mercy to the guards who would be killed if he left. Paul understood that the mercy he received from God was meant to be freely given. Why? So that people can come to know Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.16, Paul writes, But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Have you ever heard of the phrase, uh, contingency plan? It's the phrase used when you have your plan A, but you recognize that things might not always go correctly. In fact, you kind of have to sometimes plan for failure. Businesses oftentimes build this into their models, and we see this all the time. But a contingency plan is saying, if things go wrong, if mistakes are made, here's going to be our plan B. Batman is known for his contingency plan. Some people think that that is Batman's superpower. His ability to use his detective powers to come up with a plan after a plan after a plan in order to encounter any scenario, right? He even has his magic utility belt full of contingency plans. He just whips out whatever he needs in the moment. Even the Pentagon has contingency plans if things don't go right. The Pentagon has a plan in place if the zombie apocalypse happens, believe it or not. Now, the Pentagon claims that that's, you know, just a, a fictional scenario used for training exercises, but uh, we know better, okay? We're on to you, Pentagon. You know something we don't, okay? Per start preparing now. But anyway, uh, contingency plans are important in many instances, right? When things don't go the way we planned, it's nice to have a backup. But here's the point. We as believers, when it comes to our condition... When it comes to our sinfulness and our inability to be made right with God on our own, we as Christians have no plan B. There is no contingency plan for our own sinfulness. There is no amount of good deeds that we can store up in order to earn God's favor. There's no amount of good things we can do or a money given to the church that can somehow uh, pay for all the wrong we do. We are entirely at the mercy of God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. We stand in the middle between a mercy received and a mercy 
that we so desperately need. Now, don't get me wrong. Our plan as believers ought to be to live a sinless life. Our plan as believers ought to be to, to, to never wrong our fellow man, to trust God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But when that plan ultimately fails, and most likely for us it will, we'll be relying on a future mercy given to us. And so for us as believers here and now, we better be a people who freely give compassion, freely give pity, to the world and the people around us because we never know when we are going to need mercy ourselves. Question for us today. Question for you. Are there any new mercies that you need to give out today? Are there new mercies that you need to freely hand out to the people around you? So often we've been looking at the world recently and all the hurt and all the hang up and we've been looking at all the injustice and we've been lamenting over it as we've talked about in weeks past and sometimes it feels like there isn't a single thing we can do about it. The feeling of helplessness, of powerlessness, of, of mourning but not being able to do much is so heartbreaking for many. And this is where mercy enters in, this idea of blessed are those who are merciful. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who look at the state of their neighbors and in the midst of the bigger problems in the world, choose to show acts of mercy to the people around them. Choose to just do something, even if it's small in the name of the Lord, to bless and to give grace to our neighbors. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, this Good Samaritan who chose to show mercy to somebody in need, an act of kindness that would change the world and turn into a story that would be told for generations. You see, church, in the midst of all of the problems in our world, may we never forget that we always, always have an opportunity to do something for our neighbors for our family, for our kids around us. Who might you need to give new mercies to here today? Jesus so perfectly exemplified and, and, and showed how this, this kingdom ideal would work in practice as he constantly was showing mercy to the people around him, the people who least expected it. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter 2, we read, For this reason, he had had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of people. Jesus embodied compassion. Jesus proved the worth of the kingdom, that it wasn't just nice words and sentiment that he was speaking out to this crowd. He showed the very real and incredible things that can happen when we choose to have acts of mercy. And if our God, the creator of the universe, can choose to kneel down and wash feet and love sinners, then we can too. We can too. Because we can remember that the merciful one will show it to those who are weaker and poorer. The merciful one will always look for those who weep and mourn. The merciful one will be forgiving to others and always looking to restore broken relationships. The merciful one will be merciful to the, to the character of other people and choose to think the best of them whenever possible. The merciful one will not expect too much of others, but the merciful one will be compassionate to those who are outwardly sinful. The merciful one will have a care for the souls of all men. A care for the souls of all men. Jesus embodied these values Jesus exemplified this. He showed us the way. And we need to take the mercy that we received, the mercy that God has given us, and 
freely handed out to the people around us. Is there anyone at your mercy today? And I'm not talking about, you know, your younger siblings that you're choosing to tickle, but is there anyone that's at your mercy today? Maybe it's your employee. Maybe it's your kid. Maybe it's your neighbor or a family member or that person who, who scratched your car. Is there anyone who is at your mercy right now who is just waiting for you to show a little bit of compassion? A little bit of that compassion that you received yourself. Is there anyone at your mercy that, that needs to experience what Luke says in 636 when he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Is it your turn to show that to anyone in your life? The final question, is there anyone watching today who needs to receive new mercies from God today? Maybe today you have experienced the weight of your failures and your sinfulness. Maybe you are, are coming to the realization that there is no plan B for this, this situation that you've gotten yourself in, that there is only one way out. And it's through the mercy of Jesus Christ that he showed by dying for your sins on a cross. Do you need to just receive new mercies today from God? that's you, I just want to remind you that it is a beautiful place to be in, to be at the mercy of God, because God's mercy is abundant. God's mercy for you is abundant. God, when he looks at you, he does not see his enemy, but instead he sees his child that he loves so much that he loves giving good gifts to. God is on your side. He loves you. He likes you. He wants to see you be free. Will you choose right here and now to just simply by the power of the Holy Spirit to just lift your arms and just receive his new mercies even right here and now in this moment. Just receive his mercies. Church, we are the people that stand in the middle middle of the mercies that God has given us, and the mercies we so desperately need in the future. May we, right here in this present moment, in the midst of the chaos of this world, be merciful as our Father is merciful and freely give the mercy we have received. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we recognize that, that we are entirely at your mercy, God. But God, we know that that is not a, a place of inferiority, but instead, God, we know that that is actually a place of, of position, of, of power, God, because you have called us children and you have given us an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, God, of, of eternal life. And so, Lord God, we just thank you for this message today. God, we thank you that, that you, um, God, don't just, just judge us and don't just keep us um, down because you want to, but God, uh, you instead lift us up, God. You don't see us for our mistakes, but rather you see Jesus. God, through your grace, may we show compassion to our neighbors around us, God. May we not be overwhelmed by the hurt and the evil of this world, but instead, may we remember, God, that you can use even the smallest act of mercy to change a life and to change history. God, that is our prayer today. We love you and we trust you. 
In Jesus' name, amen.